Today we are formally releasing to the North American Marketplace the Atmospheric Control Module, the latest addition to the portfolio of products from ILC Dover that will enhance the performance of any Armaflex flexible isolator system. This reconfiguration and enhancement of our previously available JetBent is a plug and play module that can automatically manage process parameters and pressure within the flexible isolator. We have redesigned this product specifically for the North American marketplace, but equivalent models are available for European and Asian regions. You will learn more about the performance of the atmospheric control module during the course of this webinar. And if you have interest in further information, please reach out to your local ILC Dover contact or visit our website at ilcdover.com. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Hey, good morning or good afternoon, depending from uh, where are you joining us. I would like to thank and uh, welcome all of you for participating in this uh, webinar organized by ILC Dover. ILC Dover is a worldwide leader in the design and manufacturing of engineered flexible protective solutions for critical applications from aerospace to pharmaceutical industries. My name is Paul and uh, it's a big pleasure for me to host today this session where we will be talking about uh, milling and micronizing pharmaceutical powders in eye containment. The manufacturing of products containing micronized powders has been growing, especially for inhalation and, and injectable deliveries. Uh, and with particle size uh, ranging generally from 2 to 20 microns, this creates a huge challenge in terms of containing such smaller particles. Today, we will look close to the dry micronization, which basically can be obtained using mechanical size reduction, for example, using conical or hammer mills, or by uh, using fluid energy impact uh, jet mills. Micronization is used from chemical synthesis up to uh, oral solid dosage plants, and this process requires a lot of energy and very, very often creates an overpressure inside the equipment. Adding to that, the fact that the industry is increasing the use of potent drugs, the result is a very high risk of exposure for the operational, operational sorry, people. During the, this webinar, we will be talking about how single-use containment technology can be used to easily upgrade existing processes, but how this technology became a standard and facilitator in brand new applications, saving costs, time, while making easier and fast the scale up process. The speaker today will be Scott Patterson, Vice President of Pharma and Biopharma Technical Support. Scott has been with ILC Dover over 14 years and leading innovative advancements to the pharma and biopharma industries using single use containment technology. We will have the pleasure to have with us David Aus, Product and New Business Development Manager. David has a very large background in powder handling, and we will talk uh, how to mitigate the risk using the armor atmospheric pressure control module. But before starting, I would like to inform if you may need to ask some questions, please type it on the box and click submit. At the end of the presentation, uh, we will take time to answer all, all uh, of your questions. So now, welcome, Scott. Uh, talk talk uh, to us about this technology. Thank you, and welcome to the latest installment of the ILC Dover Virtual Trade Show Experience. Today, our subject matter is milling and micronizing pharmaceutical powders in high containment. This webinar program will focus on subjects including milling and micronizing systems and the containment challenges for each type. We'll do an evaluation of the critical issues that can impact the containment performance. We'll do a first case study of a high containment comel process where we'll, we will use the Dover Pack high containment FIBC uh, feeding and taking the material away from the comel process. We'll look at the advantages of flexible containment single use systems for size reduction and milling and micronizing. And then a second case study using the atmospheric control module which creates a negative pressure in an isolator for milling and micronizing applications. And finally, containment performance, what really is achievable when using flexible containment. 
So here's our, our major issue when we get into containment challenges of size reduction systems. Uh, the first one is related to airflow. So we have different style of size reduction systems going from low energy oscillator type, conical mill type, and then getting into more high energy hammer mill, the Fitz mill type, tin mill, uh, jet mills and micronizers. So really the difference here is the low energy mills have a lower volume of air exchange during the process. And then as we get to the Fitz mill, the pin mill and the micronizers, we have quite a bit of air that we have to handle. And this is a challenge as we work in containment to be able to work with the process gas and then release the process gas while not contaminating the area or releasing particulates. And that also comes with the challenge of the particle size. When we're looking at the low energy mills, again, oscillators and conical mill types, we're dealing with more of a granular material and a larger particle cut versus in the high energy mills, we end up with a fine powder that can be airborne and more difficult to contain. So these are some of the basic challenges that we really look at in the beginning of a containment design for a size reduction system. So the containment for size reduction applications are really seen as complex solutions in some case. And these complex solutions, at least the perception, lead to often the reliance on PPE or ventilation type of controls, the ventilation being local exhaust ventilation or downflow booths. But as we look at PPE and relate to the regulating body, NIOSH in the United States, and there are similar regulating bodies in Europe and Asia, that we see PPE is always at the bottom of the hierarchy of controls, meaning this is the least effective and the least acceptable method of control in a pharmaceutical process. We also look at the top of the hierarchy where we have the elimination or substitution. Well, substitution, we're really talking about the hazard, replace the hazard, and the drug substance or drug product is, is the hazard, and so we can't substitute that. Obviously, that's the process. So in the middle is the engineering control where we isolate people from the hazard. And during this presentation, we'll talk about that more and more. So the core philosophy is to contain at the source. Let's not let the, the pharmaceutical substances get into the atmosphere. Let's contain them through the milling and micronizing processes so that we can protect the operators and the environment. So again, more issues around complexity of the containment solutions. And here we're looking at typical examples of durable containment or hard wall containment. And the complexity starts with trying to install heavy mills through a door, uh, difficult to do, uh, one operator, two operators to do this. And when that happens, uh, the picture on the top right ends up with a permanent installation where the milling equipment has to be built into the isolator. So this is a fixed system uh, takes up valuable floor space, can't be moved easily and so forth. So this is one of the reasons the complexity of doing a, a milling system in containment is perceived. Retrofitting existing mills, unless, a lab, unless they're a lab size, can be very complex, as you can see in the examples here. And the complexity always considers the operators. The operators have limited access in some cases and bad ergonomics. And with the complexity is also con considering uh, final cleaning and maintenance. Uh, this can be complicated in these large isolators uh, that, that have a lot of surfaces to be cleaned, not only the equipment, but obviously the containment device, the isolator itself has to be cleaned. More containment considerations in, in doing a risk assessment, either for existing size reduction applications or new size reduction applications. Here we see the typical uh, flow chart for ICHQ9, the accepted methodology for the pharmaceutical industry in, in a quality risk management process to evaluate uh, the risk assessment. First, we start with, well, what is the containment performance target, which we get from the containment system? This is just not the OEL, which is focused on the operator. We look at sampling protocols, always a lot of sampling when we're dealing with size reduction applications. And usually it's just not one sample, there's multiple samples. So the frequency of the sampling. Does the powder have a low minimum, minimum ignition energy? And does that require inerting? That can complicate the process from the exchange of gas that we talked about in our first slide to having to add nitrogen to assure a safety, a safe environment is created 
when dealing with these low MIE powders. We are always thinking in containment, where is the powder coming from? What was the process before and what's the process after? So in this case, where did the, the powder come from? Where is it going to after milling? We think about the product contact materials, uh, particularly with flexible containment, and we need the regulatory compliance of the product contact materials, but we also have to think about non-product contact materials for compatibility to solvents and other issues. At the end of the day, it's all about ergonomics, ergonomics, and ergonomics. We have to build containment systems that are less complex and easy for operators to use. We want those operators to have uh, the minimum amount of change from working without a containment system. So ergonomics is key in the evaluation. So then we look at the actual product and the powder. You know, how much powder are we going to deal with? In a lab pilot plant uh, system, we might be dealing with one, two, three kilos, a small amount of material where in production runs, we could be dealing with hundreds of kilos. Are there any flow issues, dustiness and friability of the material? These are key. Powders will flow differently and have different moisture contents. Uh, this can change the containment design and, and need to intervene if there are flow issues and so forth. The equipment for size reduction, that was our first slide. And are we needing to do something where a low energy mill can do the job? Or do we need more of a high energy mill for more of a micronized or finer powder? And lastly, it's always considered to be in a containment system, how do we get the product in and how do we get the product out? So this could be delivered in drums, bins, big bags, so forth, and, and the same with takeaway. So we'll take a look at these transfers and how that can affect the overall containment, but also the cross-contamination potential. So looking at the aspect of the volume of powder, in development in pilot plant size mills, it's much easier to contain. Often these size mills can fit into an isolator or into the containment system because they're smaller. Uh, typically they're manual fed, so the powder is transferred into the isolator and, and easily fed into the hopper. Now we'll use the Fitzmill L1A example on the top right or a jet mill example on the bottom right. So here we're putting the size reduction device inside the isolator. Well, in these smaller processes, again, development pilot plant sizes, we, we have less of an issue with air exchange. And, and really it's a zero sum because air coming into the hopper, passing through the milling chamber, whatever that is, is discharged back into the environment. So, so really we're maintaining a constant volume of air and so we're not having to deal with that, that real big air exchange that causes a lot of problems during size reduction. So that's the opposite when we're dealing with production size units. And here we're looking at more of a production size fits mill, uh, the D6 size or the D12 size that's commonly used in pharmaceutical size reduction. We're showing both the example on the left of containing the feed hopper and scooping powder from a drum into the hopper that goes through the mill. It's fairly straightforward, but again, we have to, we have to be concerned about airflow because in the Fitz mill or any hammer mill type of process, you're going to have a fan type of uh, situation created by that rotor. And so it wants to suck in air. So here you can see on the isolator, we've added a high flow HEPA filter to allow air to come in. If we don't add that air, we can have a, an impact on the particle size distribution and we can have overheating of the process. So it's really key to understand that this mill wants to run in a typical process like it didn't have containment. But now we've let the air in, we have to get the air out. So you can see on the right, we've done the containment with a continuous liner on the discharge of the Fitz mill. We've added a high volume HEPA filter below the milling chamber to allow that air to escape. Now there's all kinds of executions we can look to do with this. And, and really when we're, we're dealing with high containment, uh, particularly on this discharge of this high flow HEPA filter, we really wanna consider that that design should be a safe change filter. So as we have to remove the filter, again, the operators in the environment are still protected. So more critical issues that impact containment performance. And, and again, looking at the complexities, so the containment system can be retrofitted to the 
equipment with minimal or no hardware changes. So we see this idea of retrofitting uh, extremely important because if, if we have a lot of hardware changes, this could lead to changes in SOPs. It could lead, in, uh, lead to changes in validation. The cost of revalidation is very expensive. So we're looking for ways to add flexible containment that's going to give us the protection that's needed without really impacting the system. So here we implement the, a floor pan design and the floor pan, floor plan, excuse me, the floor pan, pan is essentially a cookie sheet with a, a, a raised edge on it. Same with a flange, which we add that to the existing equipment easily. And then we attach a five-sided flexible isolator uh, for the installation of containment. So here we've used both of the pan design and the flange design in this uh, jet mill micronizer type of operation. But a key we want to point out, which is going to be part of the subject in the next couple of slides, is the discharge of the powder. So here in the circle, we've shown the powder is being discharged through a continuous liner, also called an endless liner, into a fiber drum. So that fiber drum and the continuous liner are external from the containment zone. This is very key to keep the containment package outside of the containment zone so that we don't have any contamination on it. We don't have to go through any cleaning. So this is very key is to think about the discharge should be external of the containment zone. So here's another example of a jet mill installed in a flexible isolator, but this one has a cyclone receiver that separates the air from the micronized powder. The picture on the top right shows the components laid out uh, without containment. And now we have the drawing where we've uh, laid everything out and put it inside the flexible isolator. So here we, we think about the transfers in and out, which include the product container. So as we said in the last slide, we really wanna keep that product container out of the containment zone, but sometimes you just can't. And in this type of cyclone receiver type of process, uh, you often end up having the product receiver inside. So you have to go through a cleaning process to remove it from the isolator. So again, different designs for different applications uh, is part of the evaluation that needs to be done. Also here, uh, we're containing the process of feeding the hopper. In this process, uh, powder from drums was hand fed into uh, the hopper of the micronizer. And so that's open to atmosphere, so we want to contain that. A big part of jet milling and micronizing is the process gas, so a high volume of process gas which comes in through hard piping. And we have to assure the containment system can allow the hard piping to come in and to exit so we can have the gas in and out in a contained way. We always plan on the, uh, uh, the sampling protocol, typically in micronized powder, just like all size reduction, there's a sampling regime. So we considered how are we going to take samples and keep everything contained within the isolator. Always, always, always thinking about protecting the operator and the environment through the entire process. So we work on a protocol of how to do the cleaning and remove that flexible isolator while still maintaining the containment performance target. So here we have the opposite, where uh, a powder party has gone on inside the micronizing suite. Uh, typical jet mill, I think probably a lot of us have seen rooms like this that are completely covered with powder and there's a high reliance on personal protective equipment. And, and this really isn't a good scenario at all. You know, you think about, well, what is the cost of the lost product? Uh, how many safety issues can we count here from operator exposure to slip hazard on the floor because of all the powder? How long does it take to clean this? Uh, what, what materials are needed to clean, including a high volume of contaminated water? How many days will the suite be unusable while cleaning is done in validation? So it, it ends up being very costly to continue to uh, use a non-containment application here, thinking that it's too complex to contain. Well, we broke that down in the next slide here to show that you really have to take a modular approach to this and think about containing each portion, which has a little bit of a, dyna a different dynamic. So here, it's the same type of process with a bag house filter uh, separating the air from the powder in this micronizer. So in position one, we have a passive flexible isolator to contain the mill. Position two, 
we have an inlet to get the powder in. In this case, we would attach a Dover pack. In position number three, we're simply just containing the bag house filter with an isolator, but that isolator is filling with the process gas that's coming through the filter. And so in position four, we have the connection that will go to a dust collector, a, a Donaldson Torrid type of dust collector or camp fill far, but it's exhausting the gas away so that we're not building a positive pressure in the isolator that's containing the bag house filter. In position five, we're taking the powder away. So we've got the final product here. We can take it away in an endless uh, or continuous liner. Uh, that can be a Dover pack. Again, a split butterfly valve with a powder bag. But remember here we have the opportunity that that, that packaging material is all external of the containment zone. So we don't have any risk of exposure, contamination and so forth from that package being inside the containment zone. So our first case, case study is, is with a co-mill and using the Dover Pack technology. Uh, we've referenced the Dover Pack technology a couple of times in the presentation. So here you see the Dover Pack feeding the co-mill top and receiving it from the bottom. This happens to be a U20 underdrive co-mill. Again, the underdrive co-mill is, uh, is, is, is very simple to, to do a containment like this. And it's simple because it's set up with tri-clamp connections top and bottom. And so we set up our O-ring canister system, which is the connection hardware for the Dover packs. And it's a system with the O-ring canister, with some simple clamps and a seal separate system, uh, the crimp lock. So we'll see this, that it's easy to maintain containment and we can do up to 10 Dover pack connections while maintaining that high containment without any cleaning or any other activities that would have to go on in the line. So just a little bit about the Dover pack and containment and, and, and part of this case study and some of the benefits of this. So high containment, absolutely pro proven to be 250 uh, nanograms uh, or less, nanograms per cubic meter. And we have had applications where there needed to be a higher level of containment. So we have a coax model of the Dover pack can, that can go to less than 30 nanograms per cubic meter a full range of sizes. We always connect with standard tri-clamps. It's a simple lift system to position the, uh, the Dover pack. We don't need anything complicated to lift and position and dock. Uh, the flexible wall of the Dover pack in any FIBC is very important when we're dealing with pore flowing powders that may have a tendency to bridge. Uh, the Dover pack is built with ArmorFlex film, which is very solvent resistant, and it's also anti-static. This is key in some of the processes, and this anti-static film will comply with ATEX for the European uh, requirements and also is rated for some of the models as a type C FIBC. A uh, beautiful thing with the Dover pack is it's designed with an inline sampling sleeve. So again, we talk about the sampling protocols, and here we built that into the Dover pack, and it's easy to disposal after use. Uh, without exposure to the operators or to the environment. So on with our case study. So this was actually the uh, summary table for the Dover pack and the containment system on the co-mill. We followed the uh, SME pack protocol from ISPE and using the sing single point transfer system methodology. Uh, lactose uh, standard was used as a surrogate. Each iteration, so you can see we did three iterations, uh, used at least 25 kilograms of lactose. And the test was done each time docking a Dover pack on top and filling into another Dover pack on bottom. So we did those, those individual dock and separates for these three iterations. A key to understand here is the lactose used was not loaded with excipients. So this test was really a test of a drug substance containment with a 100% drug loading. So when we look at the results, we have very nice results. Um, the OBZ, the operator breathing zones were, were monitored first and then we have area samplers. And in the OBZs, we can see that the assistant in looking at the geom geometric mean analysis at the far right was about 240 nanograms per cubic meter. That's pretty good containment. But as we look at this, this again is 100% drug loading which is really not the case as we look at a lot of these oral solid dosage processes 
they'd use milling and micronizing applications. In a lot of cases, our drug loading could, could be 10%. In that case, the results of this test would have been closer to 24 nanograms per cubic meter. Cubic meter. So very interesting, very good results that we saw here. Now through this, we as we uh, created the test plan uh, for the co-mill, we also thought about an upset condition that might require us to open up the milling chamber and access the screen and or the impeller. So you can see the picture on the right is, uh, is actually a flexible isolator that was integrated into the containment system. So in the middle of a process, if we had to, if we had to access the, um, the milling chamber, we could do that in a highly contained way. We've also done this on other type of mills. So we're seeing a schematic here of the Fruit MFH mill. Uh, so this has a, a milling chamber that's a unibody with a door on the front to access the, uh, the rotor and the screen. And so we simply have a portable isolator that we roll up, dock, and we can, uh, we can access that area by opening that door in a high contained way. But back to the Comil uh, case study, you can see the data set again here, somewhat similar to actually the Dover pack process that we saw in the last data set. And we see the operator, uh, the assistant operator, was at about 350 nanograms per cubic meter, remembering one more time that this was 100% drug loading and so if it was 10% of uh, drug loading in this, that our actual containment would have been closer to 35 nanograms per cubic meter. So we look at advantages of flexible containment and we specifically look at that market segment of multiple product facilities, multi-product facilities or contract manufacturing organizations. So what are the benefits? Low CapEx for retrofit and new installation, really a big financial benefit. We look at the fact that the single-use consumables are purchased only when needed for campaigns. So CMOs are all about campaigning and so forth. So they may only need consumables two or three times a year, sometimes maybe more. So you buy them as you need them. Proven high containment. So the Comil case study that we just presented uh, is backed up by dozens and dozens of additional SMEPAC studies. So we, we know we have high containment solutions for the range of milling uh, processes that are out there. It really, one of the great benefits for multi-product facilities is the reduced cleaning for faster campaigns. If we can clean up much faster, we're ready for the next campaign so much faster, which also reduce cleaning for faster campaigns goes to reduce risk of cross-contamination. The ISP risk map document tells us that the number one reason for cross-contamination in the pharmaceutical industry is a mix up of having the wrong powders come into a process. But after that, the number one, uh, the number two reason is retention on surfaces that go from one batch to another batch. So if we can reduce the amount of uh, surfaces that need to be cleaned, i.e. the containment system is disposable and doesn't need to be cleaned, we reduce the risk of retention and cross-contamination. So then we look at the financial value here. And Two identical isolators that you can see on the right. The, the top one obviously is durable. The, the bottom is the flexible system. We really evaluated this to show a financial cost for the CapEx. Uh, we, there's other costs for floor space. There's other costs for cleaning protocols that totaled up to really an acquisition cost of about $775,000. And then there's always operational expenses of cleaning, which is a really large expense when it comes to these type of isolators. And then we have the waste to deal with, and there's always glove and gasket maintenance. We know that these isolators uh, can often have the weakest point as the glove or the gasket. But in the flexible isolator, it's uh, the CapEx is low, it's very portable, and there's other benefits, including from a financial standpoint, only a cost of $55,000. We know that there's a discussion about the operating expenses of using consumables, but in this case, the isolator, the consumables needed for each batch would be about $2,500. And the delta between the durable and the flexible of about $700,000 really shows a long-term cost of ownership benefit to go with the flexible system. Again, another value, so we take that flexible system and the design actually had a co-mill inside that was being fed by a Dover pack. So that's ready to go, very simple installation uh, and, and not needing any other equipment other than a simple lifting hoist kind of system. 
but the comparison was looking at using a stainless steel bin to feed this isolator system. Well, using a stainless steel bin in high containment requires a split butterfly valve and then a precision lift and docking system. And then after that, those stainless steel bins require a washing system or, and or a, um, uh, a CIP system. So that amounts to about another half a million dollars in CapEx and more required fixed floor space. So again, lots of financial advantages in using flexible containment. So now I'm going to pass this on to Dave Howes as he takes us through the next part in starting with a case study. Thank you, Scott. I am now gonna present a couple more case studies for containment of milling operations. But in these instances, the new atmospheric control module will play a key role, not just in providing additional containment risk mitigation, but resolving particular operational issues associated with these specific mills and their application. So let me give a quick overview of the atmospheric control module. The atmospheric control module being formally launched today in a reconfigured upgraded form of an established and successful product enhances the performance of any ILC Dover containment solution. A range of standard models are available, all of which provide a plug and play operation that provides additional containment risk mitigation by maintaining the containment space under vacuum. In addition, it can deliver additional process parameter control to enhance your operation, such as oxygen, and relative humidity monitoring and management. The basic function of the atmospheric control module is achieved by providing a regulated gas feed into the containment space and then extract this gas using a variable speed fan. The extraction rate controlled to reach and maintain a set point vacuum level. ILC Dover strongly recommend a vacuum level of minus 15 pascals, as this allows retention of the ergonomics associated with soft goods used in forming the containment barrier. Control is provided by an onboard PLC, with an HMI provided for operator oversight and functional management. This simple schematic captures the basic operation of the atmospheric control module previously described. Note the three connections between the atmospheric control module and the containment space, those being the gas feed, gas extraction, and differential pressure sensor. The set point vacuum we previously mentioned is actually a negative differential pressure when compared to the ambient pressure of the isolator location. Detailed information and specifications are available on our website. Our first atmospheric control module empowered case study is a jet mill. This is widely used mill type available from multiple manufacturers, but offers some particular challenges with respect to containment. This cutaway schematic offers a good summary of the design and operational principle of the jet mill. The airflow, th airflow through this mill type is critical to its performance. The schematic here has been highlighted to show the air inlet points, the powder inlet or feed point, and powder outlet or discharge point. It is the containment of both the powder feed and discharge points that must be designed for in any isolator system. But these two particular points provide differing challenges that the atmospheric control module can act to overcome. This 3D model is an example of an ILC Dover flexible isolator solution for a jet mill. It has two distinct sections adapted to fit the specific mill design, 
containing the powder feed and discharge points highlighted here. But powder containment is not the only challenge with this application. The flexible isolator solution shown would not work without the atmospheric control module or alternatively some clumsy labor intensive manual management of the pressure regimes created by this type of mill. The airflow through the jet mill creates a vacuum at the powder inlet point which will suck down or deflate the flexible isolator. At the powder discharge point, the exiting gas pressure will inflate the flexible isolator. Gas management is required at both points to avoid failure, failure of the flexible isolator and subsequent loss of containment. The atmospheric control module performs two functions in this instance. One, maintains the isolator under vacuum, thus providing additional risk mitigation with respect to containment. And two, gas flow management. Both of these are automatically controlled, freeing the operator to concentrate on the process, not management of the isolator. The gas management at the feed point is quite simple. The regulated gas feed from the atmospheric control module to the isolator is increased to balance the vacuum generated at this point by the mill operation. The flow set to manage the maximum vacuum generation condition as this will vary. The extraction fan speed is automatically controlled to maintain a gas extraction rate that achieves and maintains the set point vacuum level within the isolator. For the case of the powder outlet isolator, the extraction fan speed will automatically increase to deal with the additional gas generated at this point. Again, working to achieve and maintain the set point vacuum level within the isolator. Our second case study is a pack off system. What do we mean by pack off? This is any system whereby powder is discharged from a dryer and charged directly into packaging of some form. For this example, drums. However, the powder requires milling in line before the drums and the drums need to be filled to a precise weight, typically less than 1% in accuracy. And this whole operation must be performed with high containment. ILC Dover has a unique solution for this application, one needing the atmospheric control module to work. This simple schematic captures the system for our example, dryer feeding mill feeding drum. I'm sure many people listening to this webinar have this system in some form. Highlighted is the containment challenge, that of both the meal inlet and outlet and charging of powder to multiple containers. And the multiple typically makes it harder, although not for ILC Dover. The second challenge is accurate weight measurement. This is a challenge because of the need for a closed system for containment that also receives a varying amount of gas typically from the drier nitrogen inerting system. A varying amount of gas in a set volume means a variation in pressure. And this pressure change will directly impact the scale reading. The previous simplified schematic looks like this when presented as a formal PNID. There is a lot of detail here to absorb but the next slide highlights the key points of interest. The rotary valve, fundamentally key to a dosing system. The mill, in this example, a comb mill, installed in line but designed to be accessed for routine maintenance activities. The weight scale, the bottommost part of the system, but as mentioned previously, 
Its performance is critical to achieving accurate dosing in the packaging receiving the powder. And here is how the PNID converts into a physical layout as shown by this 3D model. The atmospheric control module delivers automated control of two key aspects of this mill containment system. It keeps the containment space under vacuum, thus providing additional risk mitigation. And it manages the gas flow entering and leaving the system so the pressure is maintained at a constant level, thus eliminating the errors in the weighing that will occur if the system pressure is allowed to vary. In summary, a total but simple solution. Obviously, there are a host of details associated with both of these case studies that could not be addressed in this short time. If you have heard anything here that you regard as a challenge in your existing or planned operation, please reach out to your local ILC Dover representative or go to our website, ilcdover.com. Thank you, Thanks, Dave. Scott. Mm. He's back over to you. Okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, so we're going to finish up in looking at, well, what is achievable in containment performance using these solutions that we've shown today? So the first thing is to take a look at banding. So typical operator exposure banding charts are all over the place. Here, uh, for our purposes, we're presenting the SafeBridge Consulting uh, four level banding chart. I think this is very appropriate as we look at today as even as we get into HP APIs that it really does cover all of the requirements and we're going to use banding charts to start the selection of what containment system to use and as we look at the chosen banding charts in the safe bridge model we see that your selection will stay the same as you look at the range of OELs through these bands. So this is a nice starting place to understand, well, where do we place an OEL into a band and how do we create a containment solution for the band? So a lot of work is being done around this. And, and, and again, first we established the OEL via toxicological uh, analysis. And so this is the hazard. Again, we're looking at, well, what is the drug product or drug substance, and this is the hazard. We have to evaluate the entire process, including the risk assessment we talked about before from ICHQ9 to understand what the greatest risks are. Then from there, once we establish the risks, we have to look at the containment performance target and how we'll, we'll make an acceptable standard. Do we apply a company policy? Do we use a standard like the European norm 689-2018? But with that, all of this should be based on data. And here we see a selection chart that was put forward by a pharmaceutical company where on the top, they evaluate an exposure potential and that's the risk. And on the uh, side axis, we look at the OEB range, which is the hazard. At the bottom, we have less than one microgram, so we have a high hazard. At the top, greater than 1,000 micrograms, we have a low hazard. And through data, and here we see tested with, uh, with 4,000 use scenarios, they've created this matrix where you can select uh, through the exposure potential and the OEB where the risk and the hazard stands and classify it. Obviously, the red and CC uh, CC5, uh, those are the extreme uh, risk areas which the highest level of containment are applied. So these are becoming more and more common for different companies to create these analysis so that we can apply a containment standard based on the risk and the hazard. But there, there really are no general guidelines when we're looking at the different milling and micronizing processes and through the data that ILC Dover has collected, we put together a brief chart and it's a, a, a several different scenarios. There's more scenarios than this, but again, what we look at and we stress is not just what is the containment performance, but what is going to be the acceptable pass fail. So in a lot of occasions, 
uh, major pharmaceutical companies will have a 50% pass fail, meaning if their target is 100 nanograms per cubic meter, during the SMEPAC test, the pass fail is going to be less than 50 nanograms per cubic meter. There's also then the more stricter EN689-2018 test that says in a small sampling set, typical of a SMEPAC uh, containment assessment, that we, we're, only go, we're only allowed to be at 10% of the containment target. So the 100 nanogram per cubic meter turns into 10 nanograms per cubic meter for a pass fail. As we can see, adding the ACM, as Dave has described, to a flexible isolator design will improve the performance and will improve any condition that happens during breach. So we're always looking at high containment and evaluating if a negative pressure system is the right place to design to. So with the SMEPAC test, there's also operator training. It is always recommended in implementation of a containment system to do a containment assessment uh, to get the data for what the performance will be. All containment systems, whether they be durable or flexible, do require proper operator training. Uh, this is key to the, to the actual performance, and we've seen uh, compelling data where operators that have had a significant amount of training actually get a much better or lower uh, level of containment from the containment system. Operators who haphazardly perform the tasks often end up with exposure issues and so forth. So here uh, we, we put an, uh, an emphasis on operator training with the idea that GMP guidelines clearly state a requirement in HPAPI that operators should be trained when handling these potent drug products. So in summary, uh, we've, we've evaluated the containment for some size reduction applications can be complex, but there never should be a reliance on PPE. There should be an engineering control. There are a multitude of mills and sizes of uh, size reduction systems, so the right containment should, system should be selected for the specific process. Flexible containment systems provide a range of technical and financial advantages to the process. In Dave's presentation, we learned about the atmospheric control module and will provide improved containment performance and risk mitigation in a breach condition. And lastly, flexible containment can be applied to milling and micronizing processes to achieve the same performance as durable systems, but we always seek data to confirm per performance. Data is the key to all of it. So we thank you very much for your participation and we'll go to any questions that we have. Go to any questions. Well, many thanks, Scott and David, for for the presentation. We we are we have some time now for some questions. The first one uh, is about: Do we have a proven mm -hmm. containment for jet milling? Scott, I'm I'm sorry, Paolo. Uh, could you repeat the question? Yeah, the first question is: Do you have proven containment for jet milling? Oh, yes. Uh, so, uh, again, referring to data, uh, there have been several uh, containment assessments done for uh, jet milling processes. And, and again, the data uh, tells us that you know, we're in the uh, nanogram level uh, of containment. But uh, referring to that, uh, different processes, when we, when we speak about jet milling, we have data on uh, lab size and development size processes, as well as full production size processes. Uh, but it's clear that jet milling can be contained uh, throughout the process and, and, and most likely always under uh, 100 nanograms per cubic meter. Thank you. The second one is about uh, uh, how can we sample um, the, 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 the process if we need to collect a sample. Right, so this is uh, really interesting because uh, milling and micronizing, uh, part of the, the requirement always is taking samples to, uh, unless you have an online sampler, uh, but, but usually it's a manual sample uh, to understand if the particle size distribution is correct. If not, then adjustments to the process need to be made in terms of uh, a rotor speed or the feed rate or something like that. So 
sampling is is a key, but it, it always depends on, well, what is the type of size reduction equipment? Uh, taking a sample on a micronizer uh, can be a little bit complicated. Uh, obviously, the sample is taken at the uh, discharge from whatever is being used to separate the powder from the air, um, a cyclone separation system or a baghouse filter and so forth. In a lot of those cases, the process might need to be stopped, which is is never desirable in a size reduction process. You, you, you want that to be continuous, particularly when you've reached a nice steady state uh, uh, system and in your particle size distribution is is within the range that you want. So there are manual ways to do it, and then there's automatic ways to take those samplers. Uh, but, but the whole thing is, again, looking at it and doing it in containment. Um, so, so we look at, let's say, uh, a, a micronizer where we, we might have a continuous liner at the discharge. Well, we can just make a small uh, bag, if you will, the, the sausage bag that, that, that occurs when you use the continuous liner. So we could take a small sample of, of a couple of hundred grams at the discharge. And so that could be an effective way. Sampling is, is, is a complicated process to short containment, but it really uh, is, should be part of the design of the containment system to assure that uh, containment is not broken when the sample is, is taken. Thank you. So the next question is about uh, rated areas in Europe APEX. Uh, can uh, flexible containment be installed in, in ATEX or rated areas? And I would ask that first to Scott and pass to David to talk about the ACM later. Right. So, uh, yes, uh, flexible containment can be installed in ATEX rated areas. And, and the first key is uh, there is part of the uh, in, in terms of what the um, what rating of, of the ATEX areas, but there there is a requirement that uh, there's a, a, a maximum amount of non-anti-static material. So and I believe that's a hundred centimeters squared uh, in in the ATEX zone. Uh, the materials that ILC Dover uses, uh, specifically the Armor Flex film, is an anti-static material that meets that ATEX requirement. So the first part is uh, in an ATEX zone that, that we're using a material that meets that rating and is allowed to be used in, in the ATEX zone. Um, but it also then goes back to, again, what the zone is and what the risk is, and this is where the risk assessment comes in. So in combination with the um, uh, anti-static armor flex, oftentimes we may need to go uh, to a process where we're going to introduce nitrogen and, and maybe Dave will will expand on that a little bit. Yes, Scott. Thanks. The uh, regarding the ACM, the unit itself, uh, it isn't designed to be electrically rated. Um, however, it can be installed up to 100 feet, feet or 30 meters from the isolator, and in that situation, we will provide a, an electrically upgraded panel uh, that can be mounted local to the isolator itself. One key feature of the ACM, it does provide atmospheric monitoring, uh, including oxygen monitoring. So if you wish to operate a process within your isolator where oxygen level needs to be reduced, we can both measure and control that um, automatically using the ACM. Thanks. So the next question um, asks about the, how to handle the, the pressure. Um, uh, basically, any visibility issues when uh, the powder inside the chargers or uh, blowbacks from the jet mill. Um, I imagine when we have a, a jet mill uh, clogging, we can have an overpressure inside the isolator. How can we handle that? David, and I would extend the question to the um, uh, when on the back out station where when we are uh, discharging powders from a dryer, how can we handle the, the pressure we can have inside this, this dryer? Well, the answer to that is, is very simple. Um, the atmospheric control module is designed to continuously measure and then control the um, differential pressure between the contained system and 
the ambient condition and it would automatically respond to any change in that system pressure that uh, some outside factor will try to apply. So continual measurement, um, control system, changing the speed of the extraction fan so the set point vacuum level is automatically maintained at all times. Thank you. Does does the containment this this for Scott? Does your, the containment data include monitoring of the entire entire process, including disconnection of the isolator from the the ACM after the milling is complete? Yes. So, so I think that's key is looking at uh, uh, a test plan that includes the the entire process, including any cleaning and removal of the flexible uh, system. Uh, we've we've taken that a step further in the test plans that ILC Dover has been writing uh, for the past couple of years. Uh, we're, we're including monitoring inside the isolator, in particular critical points, so that we understand uh, what the particulate levels are inside and the movement of the particulates. So let's say we know the transfer points, how we're getting materials in and out of the uh, of an isolator, are, are key. Um, and, and these these are at the most risk uh, points. So so we'll set up monitoring internally at a transfer point to see what type of exposure we're getting at those areas. And this is where we can make a recommendation in a in a process that maybe has a lot of airborne particulate, just what, whatever it might be, like a milling process per se. Um, that if we have high particulate internally uh, of an isolator and it's near the transfer point we may want to suggest to use the ACM system and a negative pressure system, and then set up uh, a unidirectional flow, which uh, allows the, the, the flow of the air internally to move particulate away from that transfer point into a uh, extract uh, filter. So I, I think uh, we, we've done a lot of work in looking at not only the whole process in terms of removal of the isolator and any exposure there, but also the dynamics uh, internally and at the critical points of, uh, of, of an isolator. So uh, we are running out uh, of time. Uh, we, we still have uh, several uh, questions to answer. We will be glad to, to send you a written answer by email uh, or contacting uh, directly you uh, later on. Uh, I would like to, to uh, thank you, all of you, for, for all these uh, questions. And um, today we have, we, have, uh, we have seen that containing this process is much more than just put an enclosure around a mill. And we have several big challenges around this type of equipment. For example, how to charge or offload powders, how to sample, how to disassemble the equipment for maintenance, or even how to deal with uh, the overpressure, which can be created inside the, the process by the, by the milling process, resulting in, in a containment breach. Uh, but we have seen as well that how flexible containment can easily retrofit and adapt the existing equipment, or even brand new uh, manufacturing processes, allowing to increase the production capability especially when we are talking about producing new potent drugs. Uh, this technology helps on new applications to eliminate or reduce the use of utilities and dramatically reduce the risk of cross-contamination, translating in a direct protection of the, the patients. Um, it makes it easier to comply, and we talk a little bit about that during the presentation with the ongoing law, Typically, uh, when we speak about uh, hierarchy of controls, uh, please keep in mind that the use of PPE respirators as primary barrier is not allowed by law. Uh, so the path is really contained at the source. Um, this new generation uh, of flexible dynamic isolators using the unique ACM uh, provide an easy control of the internal environment and we can control parameters like inertia, pressure, relative humidity, which mitigates the risk when we have special events, for example, a globe fail, or even in, in uh, applications when we can have powders aerosolized and escaping through the transfer ports and seals. Uh, the containment is, 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 at the end, is a very, very high-risky job. 
and the to contain complex uh, process really required to have a, a very robust and reliable solution to bring uh, our people safe home, which is our main goal. So many thanks to all of you for joining this webinar. It was a huge pleasure for Stephanie, Scott, David and I to share with you uh, this presentation. Thank you and have a great end of day. Bye-bye.